Hello, everybody. Welcome back into Debate Night. One of three remaining episodes of wow. this season of Debate Night. There is wow. only three left. You're watching one of them as we speak. There'll be one after USDGC, one after the Pro Tour Championship, and that'll be that. And then we'll be on the off-season podcast. And uh, we got a great cast tonight to... Uh, kind of bring things in and some and some fun topics. We're going to look ahead to USDDC a little bit, but also talk a little bit about free agency since we're starting to get start, starting to get to that time of year where we it's all we really have to look at. So that's what we're going to do. Um Brody Smith, man of the people, he's here. Yeah, back in Dallas. Uh apologies for last week. I think Trevor had a different idea of how he wanted to do the show, but my flight got well, my flight got pushed. Technically didn't get canceled. My connection flight got canceled. And I just want I don't want to go on too big of a rant here begin the show. The airlines companies just they can just screw you and there's nothing you can do about it. It's <laughs> crazy that we just allow them to bend us over and smack us like they do. <laughs> Because yeah. they pushed my flight, they delayed it multiple times, and then they were just like, oh, hey, by the way, you're just going to land in Charlotte, and then you'll take the first flight out the next morning. I wasn't going to have to <laughs> – they, they weren't going to give me any money for a hotel. They weren't going to do anything. So apologies for not being on the show what? last week. Um, but – Shout out to everyone that liked it. Uh, you know, obviously Gary fan favorite, but uh, this is from Miles White. Debate night this season has made leaps and bounds improvement from what it was before. Been loving the new format and the wacky episodes. So Trevor doing a great job uh, leading debate night into what it is now. I'm glad everybody. Yeah, everybody. Every time we do kind of an alternate episode, I kind of panic a little bit, but then people seem to enjoy it. So I, I'm glad that uh, people have have enjoyed that. So that's that's good. Um, Hunter's here as well. It's been a little while since we had Hunter on. It has been. Yeah, you know, just I've been doing everything but watching disc golf. You know, I watch no disc golf according to the grip lock comments, and so therefore, you know, I'm actually I'm debating about speaking of debate, and I'm debating doing a whole season of grip lock next year, not watching disc golf. To see what the comments say when I actually don't watch it. Just could be interesting. kind of in his bag. I'm not in my bag. I'm ticked off. Oh, Dedicate okay. my life to watching disc golf just for you. Your take just might be in the minority, is what it sounds like. No. Yeah, I don't even He's know if it's a minority. To the hate, it's just, which it's is just the minority. The, <laughs> I came. I came after someone's precious course, and they got upset, and they are unloading on me. Is there That's anything true. else that people hold as dear as their local courses as disc golfers? That they have no their attachment children. to their children. The local disc golfer, the local oh, no pros. attachment. The local yeah. Yeah. Local no, like, pros, in, like in sports, like in sports. Oh, uh, like your team. I mean, like, yeah, yeah. Team. that's that's your team, though. That's like yeah. what, that's what I'm saying. Or you can't golfers are just sports course. fans at the core of it. They just don't know it yet. <laughs> their local yeah, they're local courses are crazy. Yeah, I guess like, so. New London is going to have a pretty great season this year, but they, <laughs> it is retiring at the end of the year. <laughs> Um, Dustin is also here. Dustin also hasn't been on in a while. This is great. It's a little reunion. Yeah, you know, kind of like you see what USDGC sometimes where some retired or semi-retired players kind of poke their head up for the U.S. championships. I thought, you know, I might do the same. So here yeah. I am. You've got exemptions. He's got he's got he's got champion exemptions. People and forget, then, uh, man. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> people, people forget. <laughs> and then uh, Mike's here as well. Multiple plants in the background. Multiple. Not in focus. Yeah. There he is. <laughs> now they are. There we go. Yeah, best time of the year. I get to wear a hoodie when I play disc golf now. USDGCs this weekend. It's the greatest time. And also, mm. I just realized I'm super excited for the last two debate nights. That's the playoffs, right? Sure. Oh. Last two events. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. We can call them that. Yeah. yeah sure. Mike, what makes you a plant guy? What got you uh, into that? So this is my <laughs> living room plants. We painted our living room. I told the story already, but it was four months ago, and I just haven't moved them. Yeah, I just ha haven't got around to moving. I know, but how do you become a plant guy? It's or not my it... wife. It's my wife's. My yeah, wife's. Okay. So okay. you don't. Your yeah, wife yeah, becomes yeah. a plant guy. Okay. That's, <laughs> all right. I wasn't going to say anything because if Mike wants the plants too, that's cool. That's what but I'm saying. I, that's I how don't, I became a plant I've guy. I never once thought <laughs> I want a plant. One of I've them's real like and one of them's fake. I'll let the chat decide which Can't one's tell. Which. Always I'm going to say shorter's fake. No, shorter's real. Sorry. Shorter's real. Taller's fake. That's your final answer? That's my final answer. Oh, <laughs> I was locked Loving. in at the beginning. I just should have faded myself. Start for Hunter. I don't watch. I don't watch plants either. Show. I'm just Bad kidding. take, Hunter. 
That's, that's uh, me. That's what they call me. Say. Bad take Thomas. How'd you not see the chlorophyll glistening off that live plant? I mean, Dang it. unbelievable. Yeah, I know I wasn't get, watching my screen. Your monitor. Hunter doesn't have a monitor. He just kind of like stares into, uh, into blank. I'm just happy he finally figured out how to get like decent enough internet and all that jazz. So, I mean, congrats I still to you. This season on doing that. I still haven't figured it out. That's tough. You look crystal clear on this show. I'm about to say you look every good. time, huh? yeah. every time. Not a debate night problem. We I just think it's, it's, some of, it's some type of issue with Yuli's Wi-Fi combining with your Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got that makes no sense. In the business. That makes yeah, no sense. Yeah, are crisscrossing somewhere, and it's just, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, all right, let's get into our first topic here. So we mentioned uh, free agency. We're going to talk a little about it. So disc golf contracts and free agency um, have noticeably been hush-hush in the past few seasons, and historically, if this information were more public, would it do more harm or more good for manufacturers, players, and the sport as a whole? Obviously, um, you know, we got a few – we got a little glimpse into – contract information being more public when companies were really proud of their large multi-million dollar deals with helicopter reveals and such but things have quickly gone back into what they were previously which is mostly behind uh closed doors you really only hear about it through word of mouth um brody what do you think yeah i find this very interesting because i think a lot of people view this topic like they do in other sports with the salaries that they are getting from their teams. Uh, that obviously is public knowledge. Um, that is something that, you know, is a big deal with salary caps and all that. Um, that makes a lot of sense. I think a lot of disc golf fans view the manufacturers as a team. Now, obviously they throw the word around team and all this stuff. It's not a team. I've said that multiple times. Um, it's, it's it's much harder to find athletes sponsorships numbers. A lot of those we have no clue about. And um, I don't think there is any sort of legality of making those public. So, you know, looking at it, like you were saying, breaking it down, what does it do for the manufacturers? Well, I think it harms the manufacturers, right? Because what ends up happening is now players out there can see what other players of their skill level of their notoriety are getting paid. And they might feel like, Hey, I need to get paid more. Um, however, for the players, I think those that are getting underpaid, it is good for them, but it's also bad for other players because what happens when a good player is getting underpaid and now the manufacturer has to pay for them, they have to now cut money from other players. And those are the ones that are going to hurt. Does it have a real impact on the sport? Ah, you could probably push me one way or the other. I think I'm on the fence on whether it does anything really actually for the sport. Yeah. Yeah. It's fair to say that disc golf kind of does have, um, you know, if you compare it to other individual sports, it's definitely not as clear as it would be in say the NFL. Hunter, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I think that overall it would do more good for the sport than bad for, um, bad for the sport. I think that you can kind of break down the bad for each category and then I'll break down the overarching good in my head, the bad for the, um, the bad for the play, well, I guess for the manufacturers technically would come from the players that are either criminally under or criminally overpaid. And then you'd have to deal with, as Brody mentioned, those players being able to see what other people are making, but also public perception. You might have a, you might be a diehard fan of Philo Brathwaite and you see his contract and you're like, are you kidding me? How's that dude living on that? And now I have a bad opinion towards Innova because what they're paying him. I don't know what they're paying Philo. I just use that as my example. The bad for the players could come with pressure on the flip side, if they're getting overpaid, such as we saw with Kona's contract, we've also seen with Ricky and Paul's contract being public, et cetera, all the public contracts that can actually put more pressure on you because now all the fans know and all your competitors know how much money you're making. And so when performance doesn't line up, you now have an extra layer of pressure beyond just being a sponsored pro. You now have a sponsored pro with a price tag and you're expected to play like that price tag, which can be another layer. But the good for the sport for me comes in the storylines. Disc golf is always in desperate need of more storylines. And I think that stories keep the fans engaged to keep them inter interested. And the higher that the fans are interested, they're more likely they're going to watch more storylines always help that. So to me, I think that's where the overarching good is it gives people something else to talk about something else to be interested in which increases interest in the sport and therefore increases a bunch of other stuff yeah definitely in the situation with kona definitely uh applied a lot of pressure um in that in that circumstance dustin what do you think yeah i mean i, I kind of see it 
from a different perspective because like I come from esports where it's kind of similar to disc golf where most salaries aren't really talked about. Uh, maybe you'll hear reports of buyouts or something like that, but you never get anything concrete from the actual teams like you would in the NBA or NFL or something like that. And disc golf kind of follows the same suit. And it's obvious why it's hush hush the past few seasons because no one can announce anything bigger than what's already happened. And so if you go and put out a big announcement, you think that you're really blowing things up. People are just going to compare it to announcements of the past and it's not going to look as big. Now, look, I do think public information would help players as far as negotiating goes and understanding their worth but at the end of the day you can kind of bypass that as long as you're able to talk to other players privately or you have a good agent that knows the landscape and so they're kind of ways around that problem though public information probably would be a general good for players other than some of the hiccups that uh, hunter mentioned for many factors it could go either way you know the public information could either make it to where they're expected to pay more than they probably can or they might be viewed as underpaying players even though they technically aren't just based on the market today compared to the market when we were having public numbers so it's kind of a weird place for manufacturers where I think you could go either direction. I think for the media and for us, obviously it drives, you know, data for content, for driving narratives, for, you know, being able to talk more about the sport. Um, but this all can backfire if it slides backwards. If the market continues to drop, then all of a sudden the sport looks worse and worse outside of the realm of the sport itself when we're looking at, like, say, the, the bigger overall sports picture from, like, an ESPN or something. Um, whereas if it can grow and get crazy, all of a sudden that can help legitimacy of the sport. So it can, it can really go either direction. Yeah, yeah, definitely a double-edged sword. Um, Mike, wrap it up for us. How do you uh, feel about the hush-hush nature of free agency? Yeah, I think Brody, right off the bat, hit it well, where, like, this isn't uncommon for individual sports. We don't know how much John Rahm gets from Callaway. Um, we knew Rory's old contract that got leaked, but his new contract with Nike, we don't know. And there's reasons for that. And so it's not that crazy. I think for manufacturers, it would definitely harm them, Um now, there's times when a strategic move to release a contract does make sense. Discraft's announcement of Paul's contract alone changed the entire market. I mean, they're 100% affected DD's contract with Ricky, and I'll let you argue if DD was wishing they did that now or not. Um, for players, it would definitely be better for them. Um, more transparency, the better, especially for those middling players who frequently get taken advantage of. Um, it, again, it's not like a team sport, but in like the NFL, when someone holds off on a contract, a lot of the time just to wait for a similar skilled player to get signed, so they can use that as an indicator of what they're worth. But lastly, for the sport in general, I think at this current moment in disc golf, I think it'd probably hurt the sport. We already don't have the sexy numbers to show off in general. And if some of the fans saw how little some of these pros actually get paid, it definitely damaged their celebrity effect in a lot of ways. And when we compare it to other sports, I can't find any other sports that contracts go down as years go on. And that's going to happen in disc golf. And I think in general, it's just going to make the sport a little less sexy. Yeah, it's an interesting one because there's yeah definitely a lot of disadvantage when it comes to the manufacturers. I agree. And um I think whatever we see going forward will be strategic. It's I, I think it is obvious that there was a trend there where manufacturers were cash rich. They wanted to get get it out there that they were also signing the big deals. Um, I think a lot of the desire for that information comes from, you know, the the disc golf consumer that is, you know, above average is it, just looking for some kind of information or story like Hunter men mentioned in sometimes the vacuum of space that can be disc golf content outside of what's happening on the course. So I think that definitely becomes it. And as Brody mentioned, disc golf manufacturers, because they pitch their sponsored players as a team and the, that's the way disc golf landscape has kind of shaped itself. It always just seems I think it, it influences our perspective on things. It makes us almost view the contract and free agency market as a team-based sport, even though it's not. So I think that almost lends itself to, to the opinion of the viewers. Um, but going into this year, we have a massive amount of contracts expiring at the end of the season. And because of that, um, you know, and then this also includes some of the star players because of that. My next question is, I want to know what are some of the moves and themes you expect to see this off season? So not just some of the individual moves, um, but also just overarching themes, because we have a lot of one year deals that were signed last year that are expiring. Um, some longer deals that are, that are expiring as well. Some contracts that may be up the following year that could need extended. There is uh, certainly a lot up in the air right now. So Hunter, what do you think, what are you expecting to see this off season? 
Yeah, I think the first thing that I'm expecting is probably the most ev- obvious one that everyone's expecting, which is the Isaac Robinson move. Uh, I mean, he even alluded to this in an interview uh, when he was basically just saying, I'm looking for someone that's going to support me and treat me like a, a serious player, basically, um, alluding to the fact that that must not be prodigy. I'm also expecting Ezra Robinson. I believe his contract's up to be moving with him. I think they're both going to move together, and I'm expecting them to wind up at Discmania or Innova. It wouldn't surprise me, though, to see Ezra decide. I want to kind of get out of Isaac's shadow, blaze my own path. But realistically, I see them kind of landing at Discmania. Innova, I could see going after at least Isaac. I also expect Discraft to lose one of its quote-unquote big contracts that are expiring. What I mean by those is AB, Adam Hammes, Corey Ellis, Brody Smith, or Ezra Aderhold. I expect one of those to leave Discraft. I just I don't think Discraft's going to re-sign all of them. It could be a smaller one like Corey Ellis, but it could be someone like an Adam Hammes character um, saying, You know, the spotlight's not mine anymore. I'm moving on. An overarching theme for the whole market that I'm expecting, though, is a lot more one-year deals. I think we're going to just see that trend kind of continue where a lot of people are just not willing to commit to what disc golf's going to look two, three, four, five years from now. So I expect to see a lot of one-year deals. And I also expect to see several players, quote-unquote, choosing to go open bag next year um, in some very interesting posts explaining why they're doing so that we can read between the lines and make our own decision on. Yeah, I'll be curious to see how many end up uh, without a manufacturer home uh, next season. Dustin, what are you expecting to see out of the offseason? So themes-wise, I think numbers are going to stay private. I think the writing on the wall of that was that we didn't get any public numbers for Eagle McMahon or Gannon Burr. I think if we were going to still see numbers coming out, it would have happened then. So expect things to still stay private because no one can just demand that type of value anymore these days. Another theme is going to be prodigies either going to sink or swim during this offseason. Either they're going to find a way to maintain the Robinson brothers and maintain their position, or they're going to continue to slip and either have to rebuild with upcoming talent again somehow, like hope that they can find the next Robinson or next you know Aiden or, or something along those lines, or they're just going to slip through the totem pole completely completely because outside of Luke Humphreys, they would have really no one left on the MPO side. And he's more of a media presence uh, than FPO. They really don't have anyone but Chantel. So I, I just don't know what they're doing at this point, keeping their name out there in the public sphere. Uh, other than that, obviously the Isaac and Ezra Robinson contracts are going to be big because of that. You know, Hunter did mention there are some big names from Discraft who are up. I imagine some of those are going to get re-signed, particularly AB is a massive player that you got to keep, I think, if you're Discraft. But the beauty about Discraft is they had so many good players that even if they lose a couple, it's not really going to hurt them that much. Um, and then one sneaky one I wanted to kind of just point out because I think it's fun is Rebecca Cox has had a crazy bounce back season this year and she's up. So I'd be curious to see if she stays with Trilogy or if she winds up getting a contract. Silva Saarinen, it's another huge one that is up. A, mm-hmm. Only a one year deal with MVP, really big name FPO player to keep a name on. Same with Valerie Mandahano. And then you just have some guys who are synonymous with their brands that are up, like Silas Schultz and Zach Melton. Not big name players, but like just known for their brand and that they could be on their way out. So they'll be interesting to follow those stories. Yeah, that's a good point. There are definitely some people that are very brand centered that are up and and could see some interesting shifting in that regard. Um, Mike, what are the trends that you're looking to see? Yeah, so I think it's, some of it's already been said, but definitely one of the biggest things to be a lot of short contracts. And that makes sense for both players and manufacturers at this point. Um, especially for those second tier and even some top tier players. I mean, companies just don't want to get locked into something with how much the markets fluctuate. And if you're a player, you really shouldn't want to either. You should be betting on yourself and go year to year if possible. Um, I know it was mentioned sink or swim for Prodigy, but for me, it's just the end of a max ex- mass exodus. Um, you know, unfortunately for Prodigy, I think losing your best two players, um, Isaac said, yeah, I don't think there's any chance of keeping Isaac because if they were, he wouldn't have went out and marketed himself in front of everybody already at this point. He's basically told the world he's looking for a new sponsor. They'll take him to the next lever, level. And it's hard for me to imagine Ezra will stick around when his entire group has left in the last two years. And it's a pretty big fall from grace for Prodigy. I mean, a year or two ago, we were arguing they maybe had the best MPL roster out there. And now they're basically going to be completely gutted. Um, and then the last thing, I think, in terms of big themes, I think we're going to realize how much we didn't give Innova enough credit back a few years ago. I mean, at this point, it really does seem like they played their cards right. I won't be surprised if they gobble up a few more top players this offseason. Um, they saved money in the last big offseason phase when everyone overpaid and got burned by contracts. And buy low, sell high. I mean, it, they really are starting to make sense, look like they made the right decision when they held off on some of those big contracts. And now they're going to be able to get multiple big name players for pennies on the dollar compared to the last time. 
Yeah, it is interesting. And obviously, a lot of our perception of these bigger companies is based off of just kind of feel. But when you think about Innova, you think of one of the few companies that maybe hasn't been stretching their dollars these past few years. And yeah, uh, prices have gone down. Um, Brody, what are you thinking is going to happen in this offseason? Uh, yeah, interesting one. Um, you know, I think I think a lot of manufacturers potentially made some pretty big mistakes on signings. And so I think they've, you know, learned from that um, to kind of echo what everyone said already. I think the one year deal is like the safe play. I think there's some players that are not going to want that. I think there's some players that are going to want um, a little bit more stability long-term. And so it'll be interesting to kind of see how that plays out. If there is a situation of where someone leaves when they really didn't want to, but they are taking another deal to have a longer, um, a longer one. But I think a lot of these manufacturers are going to end up just doubling down on the big guns. They, a lot of these players have been, or at least they have big name guys on their roster to where they can see who moves this, who can market this. And um, I think right now the shift that we're going to see, and no one's really actually talked about this. You guys have all kind of um, maybe even said that it's not going to go this way, but I think it's, I, I think you're going to see seeing a lot of the low tier mid tier players not get sponsored. Um, I think um, Hunter kind of mentioned it a little bit, but yeah, he did mention it yeah. <laughs> uh, a little bit, but I, I, I think that's going to happen because Right now, you I think a lot of manufacturers had this idea of like, we need to help these p- players stay on tour. And I think it's going to sh- switch more to like bottom line stuff of like, if we can take these four players that we're helping stay on tour and use their contract money to actually go to someone that is going to make us money, that makes a lot more sense. And the last point is, is like, it's the same thing as coming out with a new plastic on a disc that doesn't really sell anymore. You switch manufacturers. If no one's buying your disc, the easiest way to bring in hype is jumping to a new manufacturer. It's true. Yeah. I do have a slight rebuttal here real quick. Go ahead. So this, it's not a full rebuttal, by the way, because I think Hunter is right that you are going to see some It's not a full rebuttal. (laughs) No, yeah. Here's the context. Just just a buttle. There will be people who decide to go non-sponsored open bag that truly aren't going to get like a good offer and so they're going to be forced to that but i will say that's not always a negative connotation because i think someone like james proctor proved that you can go out there and make good money by piecing together smaller deals with a bunch of different companies at once as opposed to just having one main manufacturer and he even talked about in interviews that he's kind of happy he did it that way because he gets more freedom and he's still making just as good as money if he would have went with like just innova or something like that so i don't think it's all negative if they go open bag i think there are going to be some open bag deals that are actually still just fine as far as total overall money but if someone offered all that yeah if someone offered james proctor a big deal he would have signed that yeah so that's what i was gonna say like i mean it's great that he says he's happy about it and maybe he is but I guarantee if Discraft offered him a top 20 contract, he's probably taking that. Uh, well, I, much he I, I do think back. Dustin's point that, that, yeah, I think the the cozy disc golf deals, because d- disc golf for, for most of the last decade was not a place where you got the cozy guaranteed money deals. They were mostly bonus heavy. There were a couple players that you felt like were making their living no matter what really happened. Um, and I think we may be getting to a point where a lot of players are going to be pitched deals that might be worth more if they play well, but maybe they can go around and collect other smaller retailer but, accessory deals that are guaranteed. So instead of, Hey, prodigy will give, could give me maybe up to 2000 a month if I place well, or I could find four companies to give me 500 a month guaranteed to promote their product. And that's the direction you go. I think, I think that is kind of where we could be heading because, well, it's I, also, even, if you're a grinder, and, and you can sell disc, you can put your name on more different kinds of popular disc if you go the multi route. Like, look at what, like, Eric Oakley did. He was able to put his name on his own and sell that disc and get profit off of that. Now, it's no different than, I guess, making a custom order of disc and just slapping your stamp on it in some cases, but it does open the door for you to not be tied to one manufacturer, have special edition discs with a bunch of different manufacturers, and then be able to get more royalties off of that. But it's going to require more work, right? It's not because she guaranteed money. It's that you got to go out and grind and sell that disc. Also, Eric Oakley would have definitely sold more zones if he was signed with Discraft, and Discraft was backing that promotion. Well, I think a, a he would player sell Bergs as well. A and player, a player like discs. Eric Oakley, I think, is going to do better open bag simply because his brand is he, he has a good brand to the people, but like talent wise and everything, he's not going to get a great deal with Discraft. 
Right. But he's going to be able to move enough plastic that he's going to be able to make more money yeah. selling. Got it. Yes. It's the mid tier player. It's, a, it's yeah. the Aaron Nickley, the, the James Proctor, the Drew Gibson. Yes. It's and that at the player. end of the day, the question is do you want to be a professional disc golfer or do you want to be a professional disc salesman? Like that. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure most of these guys on tour don't want to have no. to go out and try to sell their own disc. And so that's the whole I, I get what you guys are saying. I, I, I get it. No one wants to do that though if the other thing is offered. So sure. if, yeah. Eric Oakley, if Eric Oakley has a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar discraft contract in front of him, he's never saying, Ah, I'm going open back. Right. Yeah. Right. There's yeah. a there's gonna I be did. a lot of these uh pitches of where it's like, hey, you're fifty thousand uh followers on Instagram. If you get ten percent of those people to buy this disc, this is how much that's that's the pitches <laughs> that we're gonna be getting I for a lot of players. Out. I do want to point out too, because Trevor mentioned like the cozy disc golf deal. Like when you look at golf, there's like 125 players on tour that have a card. And obviously golf's a lot bigger, a lot more money involved. So like there's players that are touring right now that you would consider more of like a corn fairy tour type player. And those guys, most of those guys don't get any money. Like they might get some free clubs and a free couple like shirts and t-shirts from a, from a company. So like, I think there's just too many players getting paid in general as it is in disc golf that aren't providing enough value that they should be, and they're right. gonna maybe at some point be happy with just free discs. Right. That's in the golf said. landscape, you you make your money on the course. I mean, a lot yeah. of those players do. That's I mean, what's. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Trevor. No, as I was saying, I was saying that's the difference in those landscapes is because they have such big sponsors and TV deals involved in the sport, they're able to put the money in the purse. And yeah, I mean, until you get to a, a higher yeah. scale golfer, you're no, going to I be- guess. Yeah. And guess what I meant by with well, the point of that is like these companies aren't willing to give those players money because it doesn't really make sense. They're not getting money out of it. And there's a lot of players right now that are getting paid by these companies that aren't getting any money out of it. Because so of that, that, so that's basically my, that was what I said at the very very end is a lot of these manufacturers have felt the duty to support yeah. a lot of these pros to have the tour happen. And I think they're going to start looking at that and being like, well, this other manufacturer, they're not, they're not sponsoring a bunch of low players. Like I don't want to have to have that burden anymore. And so, I mean, a hats off to a lot of these companies that did do that because a lot of these pros, we wouldn't be seeing on tour anymore. But like your point is, is like the money for cashing at these events and the money that you can make if you end up playing well is high enough now to where I don't think they need to be throwing out. Like teams are going to shrink drastically Well, and, and they have to. And they here's, have the bottom, to. here's the bottom line. Bottom line is people, as much as people love to believe that disc golf is like in Armageddon mode, there's way more money in this sport than there was 10 years ago. And people toured 10 years ago, right? So what you may have happen is the tour at that bottom half of the field may just have to be made up of people that are willing to grind it out. And maybe that's not some of the players right now that, that maybe don't get a contract next year. Maybe new players have to funnel in that are willing to do that because there are a lot of them <laughs> I think there, I think there are quite a few players nowadays that would, would take that place, but there's enough money out there. Um, four players to tour yeah. if they're willing to kind of grind it out. It might just not be as comfy as it looked like it was going to right. be. Um, I mean, three years ago, yeah. it looked like every single player on tour was going to have a 401k uh, in the next five years. So it's just maybe not, not going to be yeah, quite. I, I guess I was just saying like my only point with what I was saying is obviously the bigger contract, they would take it, but I'm just saying open bags, not the end of the world. If you're smart and you're crafty, you know how to make it work. Yeah. Oh, you just um, have to work. That's it. You, yeah, exactly. you, have, you, you can't yeah. just play disc golf anymore. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's just it. I think that a lot Which of is players, I don't think a lot of people want to do right there's definitely a lot of players who maybe have to go from just playing disc golf and letting that do the work to getting Doing back in the grind dash. Or, yeah or <laughs> yeah. or think about like saturday nights at a lot of these events you're Can able you? to go home you're able to have a shower able to eat go to bed get ready for sunday no 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 you have to go now to the fly mart mm -hmm. and you have to sit there for hours and sell this like that transition for a lot of people is not going to be a fun one and some yeah. are just not going to want to do it it's it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. I'm very curious to see what goes down this year and and just how many of those kind of posts we see from players moving on from from manufacturers or not getting a deal. Um, because I there's so many one year deals right now. Um, okay, we're gonna move away from free agency. I'm, there'll be plenty of time to talk about it as we get into the off season. Um, we're gonna talk about USGDC because it kicks off in just a few days. So, what I want to know is, will any event ever be able to eclipse the prestige and commercial success it's boasted for the past 25 years? Now, um, 
this is kind of as things are moving right now, would any event that exists be able to eclipse it? Um, now, what are the, and I also want to know what are the ingredients to the perfect recipe of disc golf capitalism that keeps this thing growing every each year. Um, or if you think the event is uh, overrated and you don't agree with anything I've said, just feel free to share why. Um, but I want to know if any event can challenge it and, and why this thing ticks so well. Dustin, what do you think? Well, I don't know if this is going to be cheap or not. Only you'll be able to judge this one, Trevor. But just the way you worded this question, I think you could just easily argue right now that Worlds as a whole already is more prestigious than USDGC by a landslide. Most players are going to pick a world title as being the most important thing to win, and most fans are going to agree to that point. And it really, it's only maybe specific players that value USDGC higher than Worlds for whatever reason. So I think it already goes that direction. Um, but if I move that aside and I just kind of focus on some of the other events, um, for me, the only event that I could see ever eclipsing USDGC outside of Worlds is if European disc golf keeps trending in the right direction and the European Open continues to get bigger and bigger. I think it could eventually kind of rival USDGC as far as like prestige, the amount of talent it attracts, you know, the environments that it has, the courses that it can get, the crowds that show up. Like, I, I do think that there could be something to that over time. Remember, we didn't have the European Open for a little bit there, and now we're finally getting it back, and yet still kind of dancing around courses. But I do think over an extended period of time, Time, that could really be something, I, I think. But other than that, yes, obviously, USCGC, it has tons of history, tons of players that are greats have gone through and won titles there. And that's part of the reason why they're greats because of the USDGC. Obviously, the course is iconic, the holes are iconic. Uh, you know, there's so much history there. It's done a really good job of preserving that over time. And so it, it, that's the ingredients of success, by the way. And also, they're limited disc runs, the whole vendor village, the whole environment they build around that is the recipe for success. And really the only other thing that you've seen kind of do that is the Ledgestone releases have kind of done something similar in that regard with limited edition stuff, but they really mastered it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. They definitely seem to be ahead of the curve. Um, Mike, what do you think? Well, I think maybe there's, maybe I'm wrong here, but I think there's a difference between like financially what's going to help a player more versus a more prestigious event. Like Worlds probably in terms of making money is going to be more helpful to you, but I don't think you can call USDGC rated overrated if you're talking just about prestige. I mean, it's the longest running event that people like can lean on that has a theme to it. Um, there are a lot of players who, if you ask them, they'd rather win this event than worlds, especially some of the old, older players. And I, I think that the only way that we're going to have something be, it, yes, it can be eclipsed for sure, but there has to be something that has some consistency and something to lean on. I mean, we have, uh worlds which is there's really nothing other than that it's world it's in a new place every year we have champions cup that won't even pick a theme of what type of tournament we are it's wooded one year it's wide open another year and we have the european open which we don't even have every single year and it's going to a brand new place so uh, the way to overthrow this and i don't think usdgc has done anything that crazy they're just consistent for some reason disc golf loves to change things up switch things up instead of keeping something consistent and having something to, to lean on prestige wise i mean they've been in the same place 25 years they've kept the course somewhat similar 25 years and we have iconic holes that we've seen people crumble on 25 years over and over again and until you do something with some consistency nothing's going to come close to this and i'm not saying champions cup has to be on the same course every single year but make it the hardest maybe make it like a u.s open where it's always the absolute hardest tournament every single year or something like that i don't think it's a high bar to make something more prestigious but we just have to have something consistent to maybe even get close to it yeah, fair to say. Um, Brody, you've played this event a few times. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think I, I think the qualifying process is really cool. I think that's one thing that sets it apart from a lot of the other majors. Um, I think that's something that can definitely be uh, fixed with some of the other majors as well. But also the qualifying process only goes so far because the Tour Championship is actually the hardest event to qualify for, and it's probably the least cared about out of all the majors. Um, if you put it on the group in the group of all those, I, I think the biggest issue that USCGC has going forward is that it's on, it's on a college campus guys. I'm, I, I'm surprised neither one of you guys picked this up uh, at any moment. The event could just not happen. It would have to go to a different course and it would be everything that was built around the course would be gone. And I think the course has a huge, huge impact. One thing that too, that I think some of the other majors, uh, champions cup, European open, some of these other majors as well that could do is disc golf really is at this, you know, crossroads of like, should they be out in the open? Should it be in the woods? And 
you know, I think some of these courses, some of these events should be both. And so USDGC, a lot of OB in the open landing zones, um, you know, worlds being a, a, a tournament that you have to be able to play in the woods. You have to be in the open uh, could make it a little bit more prestigious as well. Um, so I'll look at it as, at, at that. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, definitely hangs in the balance with that course. Like you mentioned, um, Hunter, obviously a big USDGC guy. So, so what are your thoughts on all this? Well, I think that it's, it's no question that worlds is the most prestigious title in the sport, but I'm reading this as like, which events the most prestigious and world's downfall is the rotating courses in the lack of a consistent product. If you go to, I've been to several worlds and every worlds I go to feels different than the last and you never know what to expect. And some years it's incredible. And some years it's like, Ah, this you could you could tell me this was a B tier, and I believe you. It's gotten more consistent over the years, but that's what US DGC does. Is it is Mister Consistent? The closest thing to it currently is the European Open. The problem with the European Open, what's that going to look like in the future? As Brody mentioned, this is something that US DGC could be going through in the future as well. I think an event could definitely eclipse US DGC at some point as this most prestigious event for both fans and people to play in, not necessarily title. Um, unless USDGC can find a way to, to move from Winthrop. Winthrop is what makes this event so loved. It's also what makes this event so hated at the same time. What Winthrop does great is it provides a way to cater to the fans to make it really walkable. It puts Vendor Village in a perfect spot where it's kind of near hole 7, 14, 15. You have everything converting on that one spot right in the middle of all the action. It gives so much outside of disc golf for fans to do. It also treats players ways they kind of should be treated. They have like a separate warm-up area. They have separate parking from the fans. They don't have to interact with fans unless they want to. It treats them as pros have been doing that for a while. Where it fails is kind of what Brody talked about, optics and limitations provided by the university in the future of that. But if they're able to move from that property to a disc golf specific property and recreate some of what makes Winthrop great, then I think the world is their oyster. Yeah, Harry Bottle. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So just to Brody's point, um, I mean, for calling us out uh, the first two out, uh, yeah, of course it's on a college campus. Like the question wasn't what's wrong with USDGC. Like that's a big issue and that's going to affect it in the long term. But that was kind of my point. Like our most prestigious event is at a place that we don't know the the future of it. And it's on a college campus, not even on a des disc golf dedicated property. Like the bar is not high to make a more prestigious event. We just think it's prestigious because it's been so consistent. All that matters is consistency at this point. So early in disc golf. And if you, found a new major that could just be consistent for a long period of time this wouldn't seem like that special of an event that's a to me i think that, that, that I, was... I didn't quite i didn't quite get to it but to your point uh i think the champions cup is the one that's most primed to take it over they just have to lean into what they had started where it's got to be at one course it's got to become the wooded major it's gotta it's got to lean into that identity and be consistent because then it can be on a disc golf specific property and honestly they just kind of have to get organizers that in my opinion prioritize the fan experience more than their bank account dollars the next week um but that I think is pretty crucial. If Champions Cup were to be consistent, the consistency is what's what makes USCGC. I got a rebuttal too, by the way. Let's Whenever. get all the butts. Come yeah, on. Yeah. In what universe do you think a player wants to win USCGC more than they want to win Worlds? Germ and Yuli have both said they'd rather win USCGC. I don't Ricky, believe it. Currently, Ricky's, I would agree. They, I think Ricky's I think he's already won it. More. He's already won Worlds. But do you think that he would want to win USCGC if he had never won Worlds? Well, he no, thinks more no, currently. If he, if, if he thinks world's more important than when you want to win worlds again over UCC, like they, I'm not saying, I'm not saying if I would, which one I'd want to win more, but the point is people have said it. It's a more pop, like it's means more to them, like sentimentally in disc golf to win that event over. It really makes a little sense. Jerm makes a little sense because it's local. So that's, that's I guess, why I think but that's I, I'm just saying if you have bit. a player who has won neither yet, then they're going to choose worlds every day of the week over winning USCGC. Now they already have a world title, Maybe it's a little bit different. Also, um, too, like German Yuli aren't really strapped on the cash uh, as other players might be. So, again, like everyone said, Worlds, obviously, you make a lot more money if you win that versus USCGC. So, okay. there's something like that. Yeah, but I mean, if we're talking, but I feel like we're just leaning into financials here. Like, you win more money from I'm the I'm not even talking about financials. I'm talking about the title. If the if you won, if you knew you were going to have the same amount of money because of winning one or the other, you don't think people would choose USDGC? No, they choose worlds every time. I, I, I guess I just disagree with that. 
stuff. Like uh, the, the, name world, of, the name world Grim. champion is very flashy. It's it's tough to get past. I think I think to to Mike's point, I think a lot of people would rather win the event USDGC. They'd rather be the called problem world is, champion. The problem's the title. The problem I agree. and and, and that is the, the problem is also the money that comes with the title. Obviously, yeah, I, as much as you're trying to take that out of it, it's like. And I want to be very clear. I'm not killing USDGC. It's a fantastic event. It's definitely number two to worlds. There's no doubt about it as far as like importancy, relevancy, prestige, all that jazz. Like it's still very valuable. But I just have a hard time believing people wouldn't choose worlds over USDGC. So the the, the main the main thing I think that what we're talking about here is when you when you show up to USDGC as a spectator, it is different than every yeah. other event. Now. Is there room to grow? Yeah, because if anyone's ever gone to an NFL game and has gone to the Super Bowl, it's different. If anyone's ever gone to a PJ Tour event and has gone to the Masters or has gone to the European Open or the US Open, it's different. The difference between a normal Elite Series event and USDGC is so small, but it's still, there is a difference there. And some worlds like Hunter's Point, brother, like Utah, I get what you're saying that, on the course world, thing, but that, most that, people don't remember that when they look back at no, world I'm not even talking about the course. I'm talking about just like showing up. Sure, it doesn't, it doesn't feel it doesn't feel the, different. The take is the take is this, and it's very simple. Ask yourself the question: Who is in charge of running the three other majors? And ask yourself who's in charge of running USDGC. <laughs> there is the answer. Uh, to your the, question. the only the only other major that gets brought into this conversation of like, man, it, it could be. As, per, yeah. as like is European Open, which is also not ran by the PDGA. Correct. It's yeah. like, it, I think the Champions Cup is just too new and had too many unfortunate things happen to it that it's kind of hard to judge that one too. But it'll always yeah. have limitations. The unfortunate things yeah. that happen to it, like them yeah. moving from a wooded course to a wide open golf course. No, I agree. That was a bad decision. Yeah. But yeah. I just missed the original stupidity. plan getting fumbled isn't necessarily the, anyone's the fault. Bottom but that wasn't is... even their original plan because the year two, they announced it at Deglo until everyone right. came after them. Yeah. But yeah. I think if nothing happens to what Appling and they're able to stay there and set up there and that unfortunate situation doesn't happen, I think we have a different view of Champions Cup for yeah. sure. Though, I right? think yeah. as a tournament, yes, but I think as a spectator event, the PDGA does sure not push the boundary. The, the sure. bottom line is USDGC was created by at the time the largest financial entity in the sport and they invested in it and they've they've invested in a brand for that event and they've put they put money forth to ensure that the event is a success. They could they could have had a good tournament, got a good showing and decided to just eat the profits 100%, but instead they pay a ton of money to rent the university property. They invest a ton into infrastructure and sometimes in ways that I don't think are quite smart, uh, but they try, you know, they're, they're trying, like the they're trying to make, um, they're trying to make this event a very big deal and they have a lot of pride in it. And I think that if the PDGA took that same kind of approach with the world championships, for example, which was still depending on where it's run can be a very big success because they lean on the local prop, the, uh, the local population very heavily. Um, I think things would be different because in the past I used to give it, 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 I used to be like, isn't it weird that Innova owns a major? I don't care because guess what? They do the best job with it. They should own all the majors. Yeah, no, I didn't like it before, <laughs> but then I saw, I see it all play out. I'm like, you know what? Maybe, maybe Innova should buy all the PDGA. I think Innova just think, happens to care. Like, yeah. At this point, maybe this whole time, you know? All right. Anyways, we're going to get uh, away from the business side of USDGC and into some predictions real quick because this is, a, you know, our last, like, big, big event. We obviously have the Tour Championship, but USDGC is, like, a, a last chance for a player to really put a stamp on the season. Um, so I want to know who your favorite to win USDGC is. Who do you think your pick is that could fly under the radar? Brody almost got cat merged that one time. Pretty legendary at Worlds. And then also, mm. who do you think needs this win the most? Mike, what do you think? So I think this season for Gannon has started to kind of feel like past Kristen seasons where you're just kind of forced to put him as your favorite. Uh, he's won here before. We know he can get around the course. He's pushed himself so much ahead of the field that I think calling anyone else a favorite, you're just not really being honest with yourself. Like in 2007, Tiger Woods had a minus 125 line to win the majors. And for anyone that or for the masters and anyone that knows sports betting knows how ridiculous that is. And I'm not saying Gannon's to that point yet, but I do think if you had a betting line, he'd be a super, super clear favorite. As far as under the radar, I'm going to go with someone who has played the event five times. Their worst, their worst finish has been 15th. They've gone 10th, 5th, 7th, and 5th since then. Joel Freeman. He's mm -hmm. only had three top tens this year, but in 2023, he had also only had three top tens going into USDGC and he got fifth place. Obviously, with these numbers, he plays well above his norm at this event. So I think it's a pretty safe pick to know he's going to do really well. 
And as far as who needs it the most, it's boring. It's simple. It's the same answer I give every time you ask a question like this, but it's Ricky and Calvin. When you ask questions like this, like who needs something more, I never look at just the season, but I try to look more like legacy wise. And it has to be Ricky and Calvin. Ricky has not won a major in his last 20 attempts at winning. And for regular events since 2019, he's only gone 10 events in a row without winning. So it's clear these majors have something against him. And then Calvin, uh, he's played in 21 majors dating back to 2015, never won one. No matter how good a seasons he has, no matter how good seasons he continues to have, when we look back at it, if he's not able to win some majors, it's going to be a huge black guy on his resume. Yeah, yeah, definitely some uh, some valid picks there. Joel Freeman in a contract year. Could be big, could be big. Um, Brody, who are your picks? Yeah, Gannon, I think it's probably going to be unanimous for this one, but I'll I'll throw a little bit more on why I think this course and tournament sets up better than some of the other ones these, these last couple of weeks. Um, this course is is literally just who's throwing the disc the best. There really isn't too many tricks about it. Uh, there's really no course management that has to go on. There's a lot of par threes. So it's simply just who is the most consistent at throwing their shot. And right now there's no one more consistent than Gannon. Um, and if he has a bad round, guess what? He's also one of the best putters out there. So you can pick up a lot of birdies off of that. So I think Gannon is, is the clear favor. He's also won the event as well. So he's felt what that pressure feels like coming down the stretch. Um, and so I would actually be, I'd go out on a limb right now and say, I'd be surprised if Gannon did not win. Um, I think that he is that clear of a favorite. Now, who do I think under the radar? I'm going to go with a little forehand power player. Give me Sully. Um, <laughs> this guy's actually had some pretty good finishes at this course. This course is also uh, suits for uh, power forehand on a lot of holes, kind of keeps you away from some of the danger if you do have a power forehand. And, uh, you know, do I think he's going to win it? Probably not. Uh, but do I think he could splash up into a top 10? Definitely. Who needs it the most? I don't give a rip. He doesn't <laughs> give a rip. I actually, the the, uh, the Sully pick, I kind of like. Why? I, I feel like I had a flash. I had a visual flash of Sullivan Tipton holding the trophy. Like lead card? <laughs> he was really good at Worlds. He, he was solid. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't hate that pick. That would be, somehow that works. Uh, Hunter, who do you have? I mean, unfortunately, going third here just means I have to be the third person to say Gannon to you. Um, because, I mean, Gannon Burr is the favorite to win. Look, I, there's no real way around it with his previous experience out here. And also, I think one thing that for Gannon is he he likes kind of being under pressure, from what I understand. He likes kind of putting that on him. He likes how big he, – he doesn't shy away from big moments. And I think he knows – how historic this season is and what a win here could do to his cash total and also to the argument for this being the greatest season of disc golf ever played. So I think he's going to come into this thing really hungry, which is kind of scary for the field. The only other player I thought of is Isaac Robinson. I think he could really be, he could really do something out here. Um, but I just don't see it happening against Gannon. Uh, I, I feel like I, f I feel about Gannon, how I felt about Kristen at every event last year going into this thing where I'm like, it's Gannon Burrs to lose. I really like him at this. Um, my under the radar player, Trevor, is going to love Mr. Evan Smith. He's been getting hot recently. Yeah. You take a look last year. He, planned, he finished 15th out here last year. He's just a smooth player. He knows when he's on. He just is kind of placing the disc where you want it. He has a, a game similar, more playing style to Isaac Robinson or Chris Dickerson, who like, I think they're going to do good out here too. Um, so I think Evan Smith's the underrated player to watch. And for who needs it the most, I'm going with Paul Macbeth. He has mm. without this tournament, he will lose his 13 season straight with elite series or major streak to Ricky. Also this season is a big blemish on his legacy. A major could really change that for him. I think that Paul Macbeth is the guy who needs to win this thing the most. Those are really good picks. I, yeah, Evan Smith's been on a heater lately. There's, there's no doubt about that. All right, Dustin, round it out for us. What do you got? Yeah, it's got to be Gannon Burr. Already has seven wins this year, including a major. Never finished below 13th. And the one time he did was the only time he finished outside the top 10. So just too consistent, too many wins. Just looks too powerful. Uh, the Isaac Robinson angle does make a bit of sense if you take into this whole interview he did where like extra focus at the major or, or something like that, which did obviously lead him to a world title. And he's progressively gotten better each year at USDGC. He went from eighth to sixth to third the last three years in a row. So, I mean, 
there's maybe a little bit of a chance there. And then look, Ricky's been the second most consistent player this year outside of Ganon Burr. So he could be one to look out uh, for, but yeah, I mean, burr has got to be it outside of that. You're on some, some huge hopium. If you think Macbeth's going to win this tournament, uh, yes, the extra major focus is there and he can go big beast boat or whatever the heck. And he did look good at the European open, but his game just hasn't generally been there. I think to pursue a win at this big of an event when the top dogs are playing as well as they're playing right now, as far as picking a player who's under the radar to win this event, I'm going to go with the limestone laser. Chris Dickerson, uh, he has been trending nicely lately. He has no wins this season, but he has gotten a lot of really good finishes, and his most recent events have been really good. He's already a major winner. He's already a USDGC title holder, and so I think that he's the one for me that I would put under the radar. As far as who needs it the most, this is a tough one. Um, I think everyone's already given really good answers, but uh, I will say Macbeth because this year has really hurt with not having any wins. At least Ricky has some success to fall back on. But yeah, for, for Macbeth, I think this is big for him just to kind of stay like a big name in the sport. I have never heard the nickname Limestone Laser, but that's electrifying. It, it was, uh, it's actually Jeremy Colling said that in a Jomez. Can I do my first rebuttal? Back. Go ahead. Okay. And, and I very might have used this as well. But if you say like, I'm going to focus more, that's just a bunch of bull crap. No, you're <laughs> not. That's not real. That's. Like the amount of events you play is close to the amount of games that are in the NFL season. And if any quarterback was like, you know what? Playoffs are coming on. I'm going to focus more. Everyone's going to be like, why weren't you focusing more during the season? They might not say it, but Patrick Mahomes definitely focuses more. What, in January. You, no, I don't think would he you does. Feel, would you feel that oh, way? If they said they, would you feel that no, way? He they said they they're, they're, they're five and oh right now. What are you talking about, Trevor? Hey, Brody, do you not think that someone might put a little bit more extra practice in yeah, before a, a big event take. compared to a regular season? I don't think most players yeah. would say it out loud. Sure. But they're I not mean, going to say it out loud. They're up their level of focus and preparation. Are you talking about like tapering? Are you talking about like like how you're trying to peak for a specific event? No, I'm saying that a player going into a major Do you not think that a player might take a little bit extra time on the putting green getting prepared yeah. for a major versus a normal season event? I think it's or a little just in general practicing the course more that, or something like that. I have a little bit of a side note rebuttal, which is how is a dude who said who needs it the most? I don't give a flip going to get the same points as all of us and knock me and Mike out of the finals. Base. You didn't even answer the question. I, I did. Really, I, really I didn't answer That's the question. Ludicrous. I don't care. I don't care who needs it the most. But I don't. I don't like that. I don't. I don't ever like that. What does that mean? Who needs it the most? Who needs it the most financially? Who needs it the most for their for their mental health? What are we talking about? Any Did of those would have been fine. Other one. than no, <laughs> no, get no, a free point. no, I don't, get a don't free care. Point. I, I don't care. Crazy. I don't care. I just didn't like I the script listen, when it came it, out for this. This focus thing is crazy though. Too. This focus thing is crazy. Do you think you, Travis Kelsey's trying his hardest point. during the regular season? What's that? Brody? Crazy. That's that's not what I'm saying. So if, if he said, I'm going to try harder at the majors, would you feel better about it? Yeah, because if you, okay. you want to say that you weren't trying in previous events, you're a try harder at majors, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I'm fine with that. But then, then. but then also people are going to be like, well, why aren't you trying harder at other events? And you could be like, well, I don't care about those. And that's completely fine. Yeah. And if Travis Kelsey said that, I'm sure there'd be a lot of Chiefs fans that if they weren't 5-0 and right now would be like, hey, how about you start trying? The, the focus thing is weird. What does that mean? You're going to look at a putt differently at a major and be like, I think focus is like the fair word to put at. I do think people prepare harder. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm saying, though, people use that all the time, and I'm saying it's bull crap. The, the whole idea is like, I'm going to focus more at this event if you focus at the event and it's going to turn out to you winning, well, why don't you just do that all the time? If you can turn on McBeast mode yeah, and win an event, why don't you turn on McBeast mode all the time? <laughs> what, what are we talking? Again, we're not we're not doing something of where you're having to try to peak. You know, it's not it's not Hunter doing marathon training of where he can't just go out and McBeast mode every next run. Week, next week, you have to slowly peak. We're playing disc golf. You can peek at every event. What are we talking about? <laughs> well, maybe Again, he's not. It's, not like, it's also like football. Football, there are times where, hey, I'm a little banged up, so maybe Travis Kelsey isn't going to play every single point or every every, every single play because he's banged up and they want to keep him for the playoffs. It, 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 we're, maybe we're going crazy. Extra focus level is mentally draining, man. He's yeah, we're also fun. not maybe sitting. So we're also not sitting in a room watching film for hours. You aren't. 
clearly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe that's my problem. Maybe I should maybe I should be watching people play you know, this. You're like Johnny Manziel when they checked his film numbers and he's zero minutes watched. Yeah, but that matters. Like clearly that matters. Johnny Manziel did not play well in the NFL because clearly it matters looking at uh, at that defensive packages. In disc golf, that really doesn't matter all that often. Yeah, We've seen Simon do it. Simon just shows up to a Dermans like I've played a little bit. He's gifted, and then man. he just wins. He's gifted. He's special. I'm just like saying that. the focus thing. I'll I'll live and die on that hill. That's that's okay. the same thing as the first person in double should always run it. I agree with that take. I'm living speaking, and dying on that hill. Gifted, why don't we get into the gifted points for the finals? Go ahead, Trev. Wow, someone's got a, yeah, someone's got a date salty, night. Man. Usually people are pretty respectful. Hunter, on you show. want to take oh, my I, spot? I got nothing against you, Brody. Hunter, you want to take my spot? This guy acts like we get something for winning this or something. Hunter's like just that. mad because like, he wrote up some master answer. I have a great answer, answer to the Hunter, take my, final. Get, I wrote a thesis. I, I could have get a doctor. A Hunter, thesis? The Trevor, Dang. Trevor. Yeah. You're a terrible you know, host. For the sake. You're, Trevor, you're a terrible host. You have terrible takes. Oh, you don't have is to it gonna do work? that. You can just ask. You don't you're have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> because I know that Brody would read this question and be like, well, I mean. I'm yeah, dark exactly. Put so, Hunter in. I want to see Brody's Hunter answer in. too, though. No. no. Brody doesn't have an answer. Okay, Put fine. Hunter, Hunter you're in. Oh, you don't mind me, the guy who was tied with Hunter. That's yeah, fine. that's tough. That's a tough scene. That's a tough look. That's a tough look. That's a tough look. That's a tough scene. Didn't fight hard enough. Can't please focus everybody, enough. Man. I'm trying to get in this. And the integrity of debate night has gone forever. <laughs> yeah. All right. This, yeah, this show was never fair. Hunter, you're my that. hero. Or wait, wait, is it? I, no, you're my champion. Answer for Brody. I, can Hunter, I you're my champion. Brody? Yeah, yeah, you're he's yeah, chosen you as champion. Me, I've been subbed in to run the bases for Brody. Brody's okay, this hurt. counts as I'm tagged. Can you put Brody's name on Hunter's face? That might be asking too much. Just no, just Sauce up Brody's points. He, no, Salas is fast. Watch him. If you've been watching this show long enough, you know what's about to be asked. There I don't yeah. give a rip. There we go. Heck yeah. Okay. Okay. I got this. I I'm also fully <laughs> willing to defer if I win this to Brody. Yeah, as no, one this of Brody's goes to Brody. Wins. Yeah, you're I playing for Brody. I just want to answer this question. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. Final topic. A little bit of a creative one. Um, so here's a scenario. You've been selected by a venture capitalist to form and operate a new disc golf tour that will aim to overthrow the pro tour. Uh, your finances and manpower are of similar size. How else would you plan to create a superior product and take the DGPT's place? Are there a few key decisions and strategies that you could make that could make your tour more enticing to players and fans alike? Um, Dustin, I'll let you decide if you want to go first or second. I'll go first. Okay. Fire away. All right, so the first things first, putting the money out there is going to be the biggest thing that you have to do if you're competing with a Disc Golf Pro Tour. If I'm trying to entice players and get them to come play my tour instead of playing a Disc Golf Pro Tour, then I need to be able to give them something that they want, and that's going to be more money. So whether that be just top-loading the current prize pools or adding to the prize pools by cutting budget somewhere else, I think you have to find a way to get uh, you know, that, that prize pull up and to have more enticing reasons to, you know, where you get rewarded for winning a little bit better. Now, when it comes to like the production and overall event logistics, I think it'd be hard to do more than what the Pro Tour does if you have similar finances and manpower. Uh, we've already seen the struggles with Pro Tour has had to do with layoffs and stuff just to kind of get by. So it would really be tough to do more with the infrastructure. So from a live production standpoint, I'm not sure what you could do more tech and infrastructure wise, but on the post produced front, I think they could be doing more with content. I think they could be doing more in-house podcasts and they could be doing more shows, more things to surround the season to have more out there. I would also experiment with a free lead card system. So that way we can have a lower barrier to entry for the main live broadcast, but your hardcore fans can still pay a subscription model if they want full access coverage for like chase card, third card, extra content, things of that nature. Uh, but this opens up the world to see, hey, if we build it, will they come? Will we get better viewership? And can we use that to promote ad and sponsor revenue down the line? I think it has to at least be tried. Now, on the live production front, while I can't really touch tech and infrastructure very much, I think I would do a little bit better about pre-planning and rehearsing camera angles on every hole to make sure that I have the optimal coverage for every single hole and every single course. I was actually surprised to talk to JVD from Smashbox and find out that they don't already do this, that cameramen are just kind of considered like experienced cameramen. They kind of know where to be. I want to find the best angles. I want to find what, what works the best. So I think that I would probably go that direction a little bit on the live broadcasting front. Um, and then getting away from that, I would just get away from the PGA altogether. No more waivers, no more needing to bend rules to fit the PDGA. I want the best disc golf possible. I want the best courses possible. I want the most consistent OB rules, hazard rules, you name it. I want to challenge players. If I want to get rid of the circle one putting rule and extend it to where you have to maintain balance in circle two as well, I want to be able to do that. So that's, that's the way I'd finish it off. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think those are, that's a solid foundation. I agree with, um, 
you know, top loading the purse in whichever way would make sense as a, as a quick way to try to entice some players. And I think you've also had some valid ideas for things on the production size and, and uh, logistics. So valid, valid practices makes sense to me. Hunter slash bro Hunter on the behalf of Brody. What Thank say you? you? Yes. Uh, so since we'd be operating at the same time, I up front would not commit to a live broadcast um, until we're in a financial place to offer it free to the people. This is going to immediately free up assets to our tour that I can then use to improve the tour. Um, so I would start operating a tour that lives harmoniously with the pro tour. My upfront pitch to players would just be during that off week, here's an event with a very similar purse, uh, purse to the pro tour on your way to the next event. That way we can get the big names there without them feeling like they're leaving the pro tour. They're going to leave the pro tour in a few years. They're just not doing it yet. My number one focus would be on the at home and on course viewer experience everything starts there and works backwards if a venue doesn't film well or a venue doesn't hold spectators well or a venue doesn't hold vendors well pretty simple we will not go to that venue that is what matters number one everything else comes secondarily to that i would then contract a post-produced company to cover to do all of the media coverage how's that on our social media so i would pay them to do coverage for us up front until i could afford staff it's going to be easier that way for them to film and edit it such as gatekeeper but i want the full control over the media on us so that we don't build up a Jomez brand and then years from now have to figure out what the heck we do with it now that we own it. Instead, I want full control from day one. Um, and then I would viciously control our costs. I would not hire unless absolutely necessary. So when it was in time to invest in a live product, we would have a huge pool to do so that would blow the current live product out of the water while offering it free to the people. And once we're in that position, I would then start scheduling events where players have to decide which tour they want to play on. Because at this point, we would have a larger audience, ideally larger purses from that, and a better on-ground product for the viewers to choose from that would allow us to start being profitable around year five to seven of operation. And at that point, who's still with the Pro Tour? You're now with us. Interesting. How are you okay. going to make the live product better? Well, I'm going to have way more resources at that point because I would have built it from the ground up. Are you sure? Yeah, Dustin, I'll, Dustin, I'll let you pick apart his argument. And I'll, I'm if positive you, on that. If he can it's defend it. Yes, I can defend this. Yeah, I so, want to know if he can defend it. Yeah, yeah. The, well, of course, I'm not going to cut the catch cam in the middle of the flight. Let's start there. But no, no, I... <laughs> essentially because we would be so focused the here's my issue with the pro tour currently is i Go think on. the pro tour currently is so panicking about tomorrow that mm -hmm. they're not worrying about building a long-term product and therefore they're trying to monetize the day's audience in as many ways as possible which is hurting the people they need to be helping the most the consumer my goal would be I want this to be a consumer-based product. Without fans, you have no tour. Yes, without players, you have no tour, but without fans, you have nothing to pay the players, you have nothing to pay the cameraman, all of that. So by focusing on getting as many people in through the doors, as many people watching the event at home and focusing on that product first, then we're just going to be the bigger tour because we're going to have the same players because of how it's structured that way. And when you have more people through the gates, you're able to monetize them more. And the more money you have coming in that way, the less stress you have to put on a live broadcast to monetize itself. Then you have a bigger audience because now you have better courses, you have a better product, you have more people on the ground. Now I can sell that to bigger advertisers, therefore having a bigger pocket to pay for a better live product instead well, of trying to just continue to improve one that started on Smashbox for free. And now we're just using that same infrastructure with more money. And it's like, oh, why isn't it working? Yeah, I don't know. I think you have a hard time pulling players on extra off weeks to come play your tour initially. That was my, that was I my think big you, question is when do these tournaments play, take place? It would be during off weeks, during European stretch. We wouldn't be a full tour year one. Year one, we're just, you know, five, ten events. See, I want to make sure we're there. scheduling to where we can have a proper European swing. So you're just kind of going the other way by trying to compete with the European swing. I don't know if I really like that. Uh, again, I also my goal don't is really to think that the pro tour, if I was this person, my goal would be seven years from now. Oh, sure. I like the long term thought my process. Tour. So up front, why would I want to waste? But I'm just still not hearing how you're actually going to make a better live product and be able to monetize that live product better than what's already being done. Well, because the reason the mo live product can't be monetized better is because you're trying to sell ads to 5,000 people. You mm -hmm. can't monetize that. How Are you going to be able to get more than 5,000 people watching your live broadcast? Yeah, exactly. With the same players and everything? Yeah, because it's free. Okay. Yeah. Like, are you going to be able to do that every single day, though? Instead of just the first day? Yeah. I'm not charging people to watch live. I feel like we have done the free live broadcast for a while. And it didn't work out, and they had to revert back to only doing it one day. 
and all yes, this jazz. So I just don't know if the numbers are really there. Free, you had Terry and you're Miller having to build up from scratch, like not this. a big brand. That is also huge to get people to actually traffic to your channel and you post produce or whatever you're going to have. You have to build yes. from scratch. Yes, I don't know. Well, the, you, I mean, you're building on the back. Joe Mez built from scratch. You're building on the backs of the players' brands. You don't okay. need a brand. I mean, yeah, obviously. <laughs> but no, um, I'm saying uh, is if you're offering it for free, you're going to have a bigger the 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 long term. You basically have to build like the number two YouTube channel behind Joe Mez and offer them a deal to white label for you is what you'd have to do essentially. But then the you're longer, dragging them to your branding, which means you have to build from scratch and not on their channel that's already built. But well, I don't yeah, know. Long, it's a tough one. the longer term the the long term issue the pro tour is going to keep running into that this would exploit is in order to increase their revenue they're going to have to keep increasing subscription model prices and the more you increase the subscription model prices the more you're being like do i want disney plus or do i want the disc golf network and like that's just not a good long term play well, well let me ask you let me ask this brody do you believe in hunter's plan for you oh uh, like would i oh, go I play on that like would i go play on that tour like you're like you think his plan would work that he just that he just gave on your uh, behalf. Do I think it would work? Yeah. Simple question. Because uh, I think Dustin gave a plan that seems very realistic. He had a lot of uh, of good ideas to improve upon what's already been shown to be possible. Hunter had a different different approach. Well, I think I mean, his answer was vague. He wasn't giving a lot of detail. Well, he just said, oh, "I'm going to plenty of detail." Your detail was no. we're going to throw fake money at purses. No, 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 no. So you have the same no, no, structure. No, no, no. How are you going to add more money to purses? Yeah. Also, I just yeah, said where is Dustin it? getting the money from? To... I'm just saying top loading it and redirecting budget. You literally, all you literally did was say, "I'm going to not do a live stream, but then I'm going to give it away for free later when I do have one." And then I'm going to use that money no, I said we're not to help to build up the infrastructure for later. And then I'm going to try to get players to play on off weeks. That was basically your whole plan. Players play on off weeks right now. Wait, how, yeah. Also, Every, Dustin, like, tons of players are going to play the top-tier pros series. rarely do it. But anyway. Ezra Robinson plays all the time. Isaac Robinson, Gannon Burgess Gannon. played it. Silas Schultz does it. Anthony Wait, Barella Dustin, played it. How are you B-tier. getting Taylor players Lake. to Adam play Hammes on your played tour? Played B-tier. Disc golfers play. That's what they do. How are you, how are you getting people to play on I your tour? I gave a whole answer about this already. Like to, at the end of the day, you have to entice players first with money. That's the only way they're going to move. You're, how so are you getting that money? How if are you, you getting that money? Well, I have this question. If you had, if there was a tournament and tournament, right? Ledgestone just finishes. You have $20,000. The next weekend, two hours away, there's a tournament where the winner takes home $20,000. You're trying to tell me no big name pros are playing that. I didn't say that. You, that's what you asked. I just think over the stretch of an entire year, it's going to be tough to keep them consistently playing your tour. If it's just going to be every single off week throughout the disc golf pro tour schedule. That's true. It won't, it probably won't, it wouldn't be every of it week. No, it could. I mean, there's tons but of if you, if It would have to be a much up, smaller if, tour. Yeah. But if you well, showed up, like, I got to decide: do I go to Europe over there for five weeks, or I can stay in the U.S. and play in a fractured well, field? Well, and I think that's already a problem. One to ten, how feasible is Hunter's plan? Well, I just think to, it. Just I think to dumb it down. I think everyone's plan is feasible if you have deep pockets. Like but you have, you have to have, Hunter has tomorrow, similar resources to what the Pro Tour has right now. Yeah. How now, is would plan? Hunter would Hunter's pro yeah, would Hunter's tour still be in existence two years from now? I don't know, but I also don't know if the disc golf pro tour will. Well, you be do have to remember, I'm not going to have anyone. I'm not going to have an economic specialist on my payroll. So there's I, already freeing up some I allocation. Think, I think if you're going to do a tour, I would do it as sorry as cheap as possible yeah. on a lot of stuff that doesn't matter. That's what I said. I had viciously controlled the money so when to it comes time to invest into a matter. live product, it would blow the current one out of the water. Yeah, and I would cut costs to help the fund the prize pool to entice players. So it's basically that's just what like which way do you want to cut policies? Yes. Can, can I say something My that I'm surprised? Is yes. to cut costs? Can, what, Mike? Stop, I'm surprised neither of them said this. That neither Fine. that it wouldn't be attached to the PDGA. I did say Dustin, that. that. Dustin did. I thought that was okay. pretty given. I mean, who's you attached? You didn't say it, though. But you didn't say it. I didn't think I had Mike, to. Who's attached what, yeah, anything who did, to the PDGA? Do you believe in Hunter's plans on the behalf of Brody, Mike? I'm still counting the final points, so I don't. I don't remember who who Ooh. did better. I don't. I don't know. I have no opinion. I don't know. I think the if real a question is: came to me with a check. I could do this tomorrow. I'm 100 percent confident. I think the real question we should be asking is: Are we going to see our very first disc golfer on Love Is Blind? <laughs> I see what you did there now. <laughs> I see what you did there now, but um, all right, I'll, I'll wrap it up. I, I, I've Go decided. Ahead. Go um, on. I think that Dustin's plan is 
probably the safer one. I think Hunters is the one that would actually give a chance for maybe the disc golf touring product to see a, a better future forward that's more sustainable. Yeah, a longer that, term vision for sure. And for that re- in the longer term. So I'm going to give him that. So Brody wins, to be clear, not Hunter. To be clear, Brody, congratulations. You won this episode of Debate Night. What do you have to say? He earned it. He fought hard. Uh, Yeah, I normally don't ever have anything planned because I never win. So, well, Hunter, do you have anything to say? I'll let no, you take it. No, 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 no. This is I think, I, think Brody, I think Brody did a phenomenal job today. <laughs> yeah. You don't have, like, a new Anthony Richardson card to show us or something? <laughs> I do have this box, though. This is, a, this, is, this is a big boy. Hold on. I was joking. Um, if you've got topics for debate night, you have uh, just a few more weeks to submit them, obviously. So uh, scan the QR code on the screen, click the link in the description, get those topics in, and uh, we'll make sure to get to them. As Brody that is shows a big you, box of cards. Yeah. That's a cool box, man. Is that the big one? Yeah, this goes for about 15, 1600 bucks. Dang. Oh my gosh. And you get about eight cards. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Yeah, so just to kind of show you where the NFL's at, uh, that's 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 uh, football cards for you. And, that's be, and with Hunter's that's plan, and with plan. Hunter's plan, that's what <laughs> Brixton disc golf card. cards are going to be in ten years. So there you look go. forward to that. Keep an eye on those eBay markets, and we'll see you next week.